Greetings and welcome to the Open Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland and I'm your host. Our guests today are the hardworking father and son progressive archaeo historian team of Stephen and Evan Strong. They are also current columnists inside our magazine, the Oddities eClub magazine, which you can download our app and the first eight issues for free today. Stephen is a secondary school teacher with a background in archaeology and education. He was involved in the formation of a graduate diploma of Aboriginal education for the New South Wales Department of Education. He wrote units on traditional law and contemporary history. His son, Evan, has a background in anthropology and indigenous culture studies. He's also done counselling and mediation with a bachelor's degree in social sciences and graduate studies in psychology. Both Stephen and Evan have spent many years learning, living and working with the Bunjalung Language Confederation. That's in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales. Also the Ramanjeri in South Australia and the Gamilaroi peoples that's in northern New South Wales. Both operate under the doctrine of Wirichin, which is short for black fella, white fella dreaming, and do everything in remembrance of Kano W, who is the spokesperson for the Ramanjeri. They work with a diverse, informal network of independent researchers, original custodians or elders, patrons, supporters, and of course, good friends. Stephen and Evan are currently based near Byron Bay in northern New South Wales. If you would like to find out more information about the boys, then please go to www.forgottenorigin.com. That's www.forgottenorigin.com. We will be doing three shows encompassing the highlights from two interviews done in 2018 and 2019 with Stephen and Evan. This is highlight three. The Crypt of the Pharaoh's Son. When you first entered that crypt of the Pharaoh's son, what did you, could you tell us a little bit about the a feeling? Um, did you have a distinct feeling that you, you know, it was a special place or do you have this a lot when you, um, you first go and view something that somebody's put you onto? It depends on the site. With it, you're talking about the 10 metre shaft that's buried in, yes. uh, dug into the back of the glyphs. Yeah, the one that's um, the Pharaoh's son, the crypt of the Pharaoh's yeah, son. Yeah, the Peru, yeah. And, and we actually do have a bone that was given to us that we've taken to CAT scans and it's been looked at by hospitals and experts and they told me it's a human bone and it's incredibly ancient. We have that and an elder gave me that and I suspect it was found at the actual opening of where the crypt is that you go to I suspect it's his bone and the place was robbed some time ago. But it's 10 metres. It, and I can, well, it's been cut into the back and into this. Now, I can tell you, and I've got to be fair about this, you should always do both sides of the story. There is an official explanation by the government about this 10 metre shaft. For a while, they used to say it was natural and everyone just said, oh, give me a break. And they knew in the end they couldn't get away with that. It's not yeah. natural. It's been cut sheer on each side, and it's parallel for 10 metres. It's the same distance apart, 90 degrees on both sides. It's been perfectly cut. You can see the chisel marks in it. It's not natural. And finally, now they've put up a new explanation, which is the official explanation. It was made by vandals. What? The vandals crawled into the bush, really remote place, got their chisels out, and dug into it and then <laughs> took all of the fill away. They didn't leave it at the end there. They oh. took it away and put it in the bush somewhere, cleaned it all out and didn't even tag it. It was done by vandals. That is the official explanation. But if you ask them for the name of a vandal, they won't give you one. They just say, well, that's what happened. It was vandals who did it. 
So oh that is the official explanation. There's no stat deck by the Vandals, by the way. No name of the Vandals. <laughs> but you know what I've said many times? Please, when you find these Vandals, could you bring them to my place? Because they work for nothing, do a fantastic job. And I've got a lot of work on my farm I'd like done. And I'd like these Vandals to work on my farm too. Because they tidy up when they're finished. And they made a fantastic collar. I believe, out without a doubt, that it was for some time the burial place of Nefertaru, because that's what's written on the front. In fact, where that particular passage is, if you were to go a quarter of a metre further, you'd be at the actual end of the tunnel. But inside, you've got to get inside and you've got to drop down when you go in there. It's, I suppose, the problem, you're going to be disappointed with this, the problem we had when we went in there is we went up one side and there was a guy in front of me called Gavin who went up one side and we got up to one side and there were, man, there were a hundred spiders there. It was pretty freaky and we got out of there in a hurry. So it wasn't was the blind experience you're expecting there where all of a sudden a light came upon us and we saw Nefertaru yeah. standing in front of us. It was a busload of spiders and they were pretty bloody big too and it sort of, Gave you the impression they started to realize there must be more of them around, and we're crawling around it. Let's get out of here. But I mean, I can tell you, national parks and wildlife at one stage filled it up completely with rocks, and then it was unfilled. I don't know how. Well, I do actually, but I'm not going to say it publicly when we went in there. And then it was filled up again, and now it's completely filled. It's been completely filled with rubbish and now no one can get into it anymore. The reason being, if you got in there, you'd say, this is not normal. This is not yeah. natural. So therefore, they've destroyed it. So the vandals came back then? No, not the vandals, the government. Yeah, exactly. National Parks and Wildlife filled it up. They said it could be dangerous. People could fall down the entrance, so they filled it up. No, wow. I wish the vandals did come back because if they come back, they clean it out again. No, it's the government, the real vandals. Yeah, exactly. The Ramanjuri Elders Claim. Now, the Ramanjuri Elders had mm. made a very big claim, Stephen, um, mm. which most Australians would be a bit stunned about. Do you want to share that? Can you tell me what the claim is first? Because they've made a few of them. What's the one you've got? Oh, mine was in relation to the datings of the axe finds. And, um, you know, there's the, what was it? The, yeah, yeah, life on the planet originated on our continent, really, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah, basically. Look, what yeah. happened was when I was taken down, the Ramanjeri contacted me through um, a Ramanjeri person up there they read our, our books and they asked me to go down there. And I spent over a week down there where they didn't, they just told me stuff and just watched what was going on. And then at the finish, when I had my, I always carry this clipboard with, I write with paper and pen. Sorry about that, guys, but that's how I do things. Mm -hmm. And Kano, there was quite a few elders there, probably about a dozen or so. And I was sitting in circle doing ceremony. Kano came up and grabbed the clipboard and said, throw this, threw it away and said, Enough of this white fella stuff. And then they gave me ceremony. And at the end of it, um, they gave me directions on what I was to do, on what I was to find, and told me how I was to go about it. And they started to talk about the Pleiadians coming here. And we spoke about boats. And, they, and, he's, and I remember one of the oldest, Peter Evans, at the time said to me, he said, but that's not the only way we travel to Earth. We know, you know, there are other ways, aren't you? I said, yeah, I do, but I'm not going to do them. I'm not going to talk about the Pleiades. I'm not going to talk about UFOs. That is not what I'm going to do. But what brought me down there was he, he claimed that the original people had circumnavigated the world in a figure eight. Mm. Now, what's interesting about that is obviously I thought, hang on for a sec, this is interesting. And it went back hundreds of thousands of years ago. But if you look at how you do, would circumnavigate the world, it will be in a figure eight. It actually, that's what the currents will do. Mm. And they told me, they'd explained to me how it was done. I assumed it was done by boat. They made it clear it was done by boat and by vehicle above the water, both ways. And mm. the reason they went in that passage is because it's a ley line. They follow the lines, the sacred lines that crisscross this earth. This planet 
has so many powerful magical lines where they build, well, as you know, they build the pyramids on there, they build churches on there. Well, the churches kill the lines, by the way. And the original people build their ceremonies on there. And they traveled through that. And they used that energy. What I thought it was, is I thought it was they circumnavigated the world in figure eight and took their genes to the rest of the world, which they did. I thought it was by boat. They told me it was by boat and by ship. But I mean ship that actually flies as opposed to boat that doesn't. So yeah. they did it, did it both ways. So that's what actually originally got me down there. That was the pro promise they would give me, the full story to that, which they did. And in return, I was given my first ceremony. I believe my son tells me because I've forgotten. I've had five now, which gives me some right, and Evan some right because he's had most of them too, to speak on behalf of the original people because we do get these ceremonies. And what's consistent, we've done in a disappearing ceremony, and I still to this day don't know how I disappeared, nor the others, but it did happen. Um, that was on a certain day, and with an elder that knows how to do this stuff, and I still don't know how to do it, but we did it then. Those ceremonies always link in with one thing. Every time we do a ceremony, we're always told to look up to the stars and to the Pleiades. They're always linked into part of that story too. So that's where... Our narrative, which had, until I did ceremony, we hadn't mentioned the Pleiades and travelling by spaceship anywhere. That's where it began there. And I remember saying to Peter, I'll never talk about it. And he laughed at it and he said, you have no choice and you will. I said, no, I'm not going down the Von Daniken way and getting smashed like he does. I'm not going to touch that. Yeah. And he laughed at it again. He said, you will have no choice in this. And Peter, you were right and I was wrong. <laughs> Yes, um, I think a lot of us feel that, um, but it's it's after a while you just get used to the fact that, you know, it's kind of an honour to have been chosen though, don't you feel? Absolutely, and that's and of course it's an honour, but a lot of people get chosen, they don't all follow through with it, because there's been a lot of hassle as we've done this, I can assure you, as you probably know, it's not just <laughs> threats from the government, I've had death threats, and I've had a, I'm not talking about singular, I've had dead threats. We've had all sorts of things that have happened. But they're part of the deal. That's part of the honour. Every now and then you get tested and you have to stay strong to what you believe to be true. And that's what we do. I mean, when I go on to country, I always make sure I speak to an elder of the old way law and I get my direction from them. And I make sure that what I do and what I say is in accord with the people I believe. And see, it's really simple to do the archaeology we do because we get asked there. We don't have to look. They take us there and they give us the answer. All we've got to work out are the questions. Whereas when other people go there, they haven't got a clue what they're doing. Well, in our case, because we believe the elders, and you've got to remember, it's the oldest culture on the planet, and, and it, it has an oral tradition. It also has a written tradition because our rocks, it's written on there. It has it both ways. And there is a, something you've got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, in Australia, most tribes don't have a word for lying. And if people tell the truth and everyone's telepathic, then the stories don't change because they're not allowed to change. You mm -hmm. can't tell a lie and you never tell lies about the spirits because the spirits will know because original people believe the spirits were in everywhere. They're in the grass, they're in the trees, they're in the birds, they're everywhere. And when you lie to the spirits, they tell someone else and you get found out. So if everyone believes that in this country, and they did until the whites came, then you find what you have is a history that never changes and is mm. truthful. So it's easy for us to do archaeology. We go where the elders tell us and we take their story as the answer. Then all you've got to do is fill it in with a couple of questions and a couple of clever comments and a couple of pictures and it's easy. Artifact datings that confirm the Out of Australia origin story. Surely the datings of axe finds within the Australian region, we're including PNG here, should convince many that life on our planet originate on our continent. Um, I mean, I'll just go through the list that you um, that was in that I found in one of your articles, Stephen. Mm. The, on Terrace, PNG, 40,000 years. Yeah. Your Walton Land, Northern Territory, 35,500 years. 
Sandy mm -hmm. Creek, Queensland, very close to me, 32,000 years. Malangang, oh God, I can't, <laughs> Malangang, Malang yeah. Northern Territory, 23,000 years. And mm -hmm. the handheld chopper, 60,000 years. And the closest that um, mainstream history and archaeology has found was the one in Noah Cave, Sarawak, Malaysia. And that was only 15,500. Yeah. And there's a possibility there's something in Japan that might be 20. Yeah. Uh, and there's been another axe that's been found oh, yeah? in Jawan country, which has been dated at 65,000 years now. Wow. Okay. The question is, because an axe, if you think about it from stone to technology, the axe is, the, is basically the most important tool there is. And what you're suggesting is how is it that all the axes are found and choppers are found in Australia first before they're found anywhere else? It's simply because most stone technology begins in Australia. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it's found all over. It's found 40,000 years, 65,000 years. And in other countries, it's quite it's much, much younger. And what that basically tells us is that when you start to look for the beginning of culture, for stone tool technology for religion, all these things begin in the same country. So it's a concrete piece of evidence mm. that reminds us once again that no matter which way you look at this, it always comes back to Australia first and what yeah. goes out of Australia. And, of course, ladies and gentlemen, think about it. What was the last country to lose the hunter-gatherer lifestyle? Which was the last continent that held on to the first dreaming in the first way? It was Australia. America went before Australia and then Australia. Why were we the last? Because we were the first. And that's why it held out the longest. We also believe that the original people obviously went around the world, and they were in many other places. We found skeletons of them through the whole of America. That's a given. We found them in um, the oldest Homo sapien found in Asia is in Penang Pave, and it's an original person. Um, you go to the end of an island, the original people are still there. Quite recently, they did a DNA study of Dr. Rao did it in India, in the southern part of India, and found seven people there that had unique Australian Aboriginal mitochondrial DNA signatures that weren't even Indian to this day. Mm -hmm. So they were everywhere, spreading their genes from way back. And those genes, as I said, with Lake Mungo, the genes of Lake Mungo have what are all Europeans. Well, one of those original people went towards Europe, and as it got colder, then the noses start to collapse a bit more because you've got to um, conserve more heat and you start to lose the pigmentation in your, sun, in your skin and you start to create the Caucasian race. And that comes out of what we can see now from Lake Mungo from a being that was part of that. So those things take place as they spread around the world and as they go around the world, the original people were sharing everything they had. And that includes, ladies and gentlemen, something you might surprise you, with bows and arrows. You only have to read Captain Cook's diary on the day he raised his flag at Botany Bay and he wrote in there that we saw a man walk down the hill, an original man, with a bow and a bundle of arrows and it said he's the first we've seen in this country. That was on the east coast of Australia. Now, you read the books and you will be told by everyone the original people never had bows and arrows. Yeah. I would say to you, try and kill a kangaroo or wallaby with a bow and see how you go in an arrow. It might yeah. scratch them. It might be an inconvenience, but it will not stop them from jumping because they're very thick. Throw a death spear and you will stop them. So what point and what use was a bow and arrow? But they had them. They were here. So what I'm sort of saying is to an extent that even simple bits of history like the original people had a toolkit that didn't have a bow and arrow, not according to Captain Cook. He's the one who said they had them there and said we saw them as we stood on the deck of the ship. So it wasn't just Cook maybe hallucinating by taking mushrooms or something else like that. All of them saw it, and they all comment on the fact that's the first one we've seen. Mm. And by the way, that's funny. I've read that in books that were given to schools. Yet Real. the teachers would tell them that they just had spears and they never had bows and arrows because to an extent the axe is the highlight of what you can do with stone, but with, with wood, the highlight you can do outside a gun is a bow and arrow. And, of course, the original people didn't have a bow and arrow. That makes them lesser people. 
So therefore, we can't mention that, can we? Because that destroys the myth of the original people being ignorant and uncultured and all the things that made it terra nullius for 200 years. Because terra nullius means people unworthy of the land. Hmm. They had a bow and arrow. Yeah, in just incredible. I mean, there, there are so many Australians that have no idea about any of this, Stephen. Um, hmm. This is just incredible. Well, that's all for our podcast. Thanks for listening. And remember, if you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe, and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com.